My uh, topic today is uh, N.T. Wright, the writings of, of, of N.T. Wright, uh, viewed in particular from a Jewish perspective and from my perspective, which is also a Messianic Jewish perspective. I have been reading N.T. Wright for, uh, for at least uh, 10 or 15 years, <coughs> if not 20 years. Uh, he has uh, been a continuous source of instruction, inspiration, uh, and occasional frustration. Uh, and, uh, but that's, I think, the nature of, uh, of any powerful thinker. And uh, N.T. Wright is clearly one of the most powerful thinkers, from my view, uh, that is on the, uh, the Christian theological scene today. I think he's a very important thinker, uh, and, and so uh, it's, it's an honor for me to engage in a conversation uh, with him at this time. What I want to do in this first session is to talk about N.T. Wright's project of recapturing the Jewishness of the New Testament message. And I want to talk here about his success in doing this. What I want to do in my second presentation later on is to talk about where I think he, he fails. But first, I want to focus on his success. And I think the place to begin is to recognize how conscious, how intentional N.T. Wright is about this project of recapturing the Jewishness of Jesus, of Paul, and of the New Testament as a whole. He, he critiques the history of Christian New Testament scholarship for its failure to appreciate the Jewishness of Jesus and of Paul particularly classic forms of New Testament scholarship. He writes at one point, 19th century historians frequently ignored the Jewishness of Jesus, trying as hard as they could to universalize him, to make him the timeless teacher of eternal verities. In his massive recent volume about Paul, 1,600 pages called uh, Paul and the Faithfulness of God. Wright describes the entire book in terms of this, this notion of recapturing the Jewishness of the New Testament. He says one of the central arguments of this whole book is that Paul remained stubbornly and intentionally a deeply Jewish and more broadly, this is something that N.T. Wright sees about the entire early Jesus movement. He says the Christians from the start behaved not as a new variety of pagan religion, but as a new and strange variety of Judaism. So N.T. Wright is attempting to rethink the New Testament in Jewish terms. As a Messianic Jewish scholar, I think, of course, this is a fundamental project that sh should be uh, en en encouraged and engaged in by Christian thinkers as a whole. Now, how is it that N.T. Wright does this, and in what ways do I see him succeeding? First of all, I think he attempts to recover a Jewish narrative structure in the thinking and message of Jesus, in the, in the thinking and message of Paul, in our understanding of the New Testament as a whole. In order to see this, I think it's helpful to draw upon the writings 
of uh, one of my friends and colleagues, uh, Kendall Solon, and the, his classic work, The God of Israel and Christian Theology. Kendall Solon talks about the, the overall narrative framework in, in which the, the Christian message has been articulated through the centuries. And he breaks it down into a four-part message, which begins with creation, moves on to the fall in Genesis 3, and then speaks about the redemption, the redemptive work of, of Jesus, and concludes with the great consummation of all things at the return of Jesus. And what, what Solon recognizes here is that something very important to the biblical story completely drops out of the picture when you tell the story in that way. Of course, what falls out of the picture is Israel. The story of Israel becomes merely background to the coming of Jesus. And one loses any sense of its centrality to the overall work of God. N.T. Wright also sees this and seeks to correct for it. And at different places in his writings, he attempts to describe the narrative structure that's undergirding the New Testament message. And he, he does it in different ways in different places. But at one, at, at one place, he talks about it as a five-act drama rather than a four-act drama. The way in which N.T. Wright lays out the five acts is creation, fall, and then the third act is Israel. The fourth act he has is Jesus, and then the fifth act is uh, the, uh, both the, the church and the kingdom, the consummation. What N.T. Wright is really doing here is taking the, the basic type of framework that we see articulated by Kendall Solon, which is really simply a summary of the, of Christian, the traditional way in which Christians have told the message, but adding to it and placing in a very, in a very central place the people of Israel. And then, the way in which N.T. Wright tells the story of Jesus is almost completely in relationship to the story of Israel. It's not merely that he, he is making Israel central to the story. He makes Israel absolutely central to his Christology. And I think this is uh, a, 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 a crucial uh, step that he takes and one which I highly commend. This has striking consequences in the way, for example, that Jesus' saving work is conceived. Now, first of all, in terms of his Christology, N.T. Wright emphasizes, underlines the Messiahship of Jesus. For N.T. Wright, it's not sufficient to, to think about the term Christos as, a type, as a, uh, the second name of Jesus. It is taken very seriously as a title, as a title which describes who he is in relationship to the Jewish people. And what N.T. Wright is doing here is not so much trying to focus simply on the role of king. He is trying to focus on the way in which 
The Messiah is a representative figure who embodies the entire people in himself. And so, for M.T. Wright, the person of Jesus can never be separated from the people of Israel. He is Israel in person, not in a way that replaces Israel, but in a way which binds himself always to Israel. And what this means for the way in which Jesus saves is, I think, very significant. N.T. Wright relies very much on the Jewish categories of exile and restoration. Now, he has been criticized sometimes for the way in which he uses them, these categories. But I think it's important to realize that fundamentally these are Jewish categories of thought. And N.T. Wright points out that the that death and resurrection are initially in the prophets metaphors that refer to exile and restoration. He then points out that these metaphors take on a more concrete reality in relationship to the martyrs of Israel. So that the Jewish people experience a kind of death when they go into exile. And what Enterite points out is that the suffering of Israel in exile, particularly for those righteous Israelites in exile, has an atoning value. And, and this is really the way he interprets, and many others would interpret the initial context of the the suffering servant of Isaiah, chapter 53. And the, the notion of Israel's resurrection, of course, is powerfully presented in Ezekiel, chapter 37, initially as a kind of metaphor for the, the restoration of the people of Israel. The martyrs of Israel become those who literally, actually die experiencing on behalf of Israel that, that suffering in exile, entering literally into that death, and literal resurrection as Israel's hope initially emerges in the Maccabean period, in particular in relation to these martyrs, who now were seen as having this hope of, of resurrection as in some ways the first fruits, the beginning of Israel's resurrection. And so what N.T. Wright then does is interprets the death and the resurrection of Jesus in relationship to the martyrs of Israel and in relationship to Israel's entire experience of exile and restoration. This is a kind of reconceiving of, of the saving work of Jesus that binds it up to the whole history of, of Israel in a very powerful way. So th this is just an illustration of how this reconceived narrative structure plays out in N.T. Wright's thinking in a way that I think really does recapture a, a Jewish framework of thinking. So we first have this narrative structure. The second thing that we can see about N.T. Wright's recapturing of, of the Jewishness of the New Testament is through his focus on a Jewish theological structure. And what he means here by a theological structure is the core beliefs, the central beliefs around which other beliefs uh, in some ways uh, circulate, and the structure, the way in which they are related to one another, and the way in which these secondary beliefs derive from them. In his early work, 
N.T. Wright articulates, tries to summarize what he sees as the essential theological structure of Second Temple Judaism. Now, he may overly harmonize things and simplify things here, but what he is uh, trying to do is to lay out what he sees at least as a, as a set of the, the most common themes that are central to Jewish thought of this period. And he's doing it all with really the New Testament in view, uh, in terms of where he is headed, where he is going. And so N.T. Wright identifies three core beliefs of Second Temple Judaism. And these three beliefs, I would say, also are central to later Jewish thought as well. The three beliefs are monotheism, election, the election of Israel, and eschatology, God's purposes for the world and for Israel. Monotheism, election, and eschatology. After describing how these function within Jewish writings as a whole, he then employs these categories as his basic theological categories for understanding the New Testament, for understanding Jesus, for understanding Paul, for understanding the early Jesus community and movement as a whole. In speaking about theology proper, theology meaning the understanding of God, I think it's significant that he begins with monotheism, the sense of the one God, the one God of Israel. This is what he sees, of course, as central to Judaism, but this is what he sees as central to the New Testament, recapturing this message of the one God, the one God of Israel, and not just a kind of generic God who is a kind of philosophical abstraction. This is the God who is situated within the biblical narrative and identified by that narrative. And then moving on to election, what election focuses on, of course, is the corporate reality of Israel. The one God has this one people that he, that, that he calls into existence to bear witness to, to the God of Israel in the world, to fulfill God's purpose within the world. And this one people is chosen not simply for itself, but it's chosen also for the sake of all of the other nations of the world. It has a kind of priestly function in the world. And then that priestly function is reflected in eschatology. This concern that the one God has to work through the one people for the sake of the healing and redemption and restoration, the setting right of all things, of all of creation. And here the focus on eschatology in particular is focused, has a kind of cosmic scope. It's focused on the creation as a whole. It's, it's an, not an eschatology of individuals who are being saved and, uh, and going to heaven. It's an eschatology of a renewed creation. And within this framework, N.T. Wright attempts to situate all of 
the, the New Testament message. We see it in his writings about Jesus and the Gospels. At one point he says, Jesus affirmed Israel's election, Israel's belief in her God, and Israel's eschatological hope. But this status, meaning Israel's election, this theology, namely this confession of monotheism, and this aspiration, this eschatological hope, were to be redefined around a new set of symbols. I'll talk more about the uh, N.T. Wright's discussion of symbols uh, in my second presentation. And then, in talking about Paul, in his most recent work, he says, when therefore we allow Paul's native Jewish world to set the theological agenda, we see the three major points of what might be called Jewish theology, substantially reinterpreted, reworked around the Messiah and the Spirit. The three categories are monotheism, election, and eschatology. One God, one people of God, one future for God's world. And so we have this, this Jewish theological structure, and it's, it's quite striking because uh, it means that, that the way in which N.T. N.T. Wright considers a figure like Paul is he doesn't use the, the, the traditional categories or frames of reference that Christian theology would normally use. In particular, he doesn't focus so much on this category of soteriology. And he's been criticized for this, uh, but he rather boldly uh, defends his own position. He has, for example, been criticized for collapsing soteriology into ecclesiology. Uh, but what N.T. Wright says is the place to understand God's saving work is in the context of the election of Israel. This is what Israel is about. And it's to understand it also in relationship to God's ultimate purpose for the election of Israel, which is the redemption of the world, the healing of the world, the eschatological hope. So it's not that N.T. Wright is ignoring soteriology. He is simply setting it in a new context. And I would argue it's a more Jewish context. And so, again, I think that in, in emphasizing this Jewish theological structure, N.T. Wright really has accomplished something. To interpret Paul as a theologian of monotheism, election, and eschatology, uh, I think is a bold move and, 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 and one which I think is, is worth pursuing further. Finally, what N.T. Wright does, and you can already see it in some of the things that I've presented in talking about the narrative structure and the theological structure, is he's trying to recapture certain Jewish ways of thinking. And these are like patterns of thought. They're not so much a, uh, a matter of a narrative structure or a set of beliefs. They're habits or they're emphases. And let me give you some examples. One would be a, what I would call a holistic view of the world and the human being. One of the tendencies for Christian theology and Western thought 
as a whole is to fall into various forms of dualistic thinking in which the physical world and the spiritual world are, uh, are set as these, uh, these not simply two aspects of reality, but two opposing principles. Or the earthly and the heavenly. Or the natural and the supernatural. These kinds of dualities that we often think on are rather alien to Jewish thought, which operates in a more integrated way of approaching life. And this is really a, a crucial part of N.T. Wright's project. And so he wrote you know, an entire book uh, on challenging the Christian way of thinking about our ultimate destiny. You know, his, his book on heaven, challenging this notion of, of our hope as our hope being dying and going to heaven. You know, for N.T. Wright, heaven is, it's, it's a way of talking about, about God. And in fact, this is even, you know, Jewish thought. For Jewish thought, the Hebrew word shemayim, heaven, actually simply becomes a replacement word for God. So that New Testament scholars, for example, of the Gospel of Matthew, will often point out there's not really a difference between the, the phrase kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is not a kingdom that's in heaven. Shemayim is just a word that's used to replace God. God's reign is not simply over a place, heaven, it's over heaven and earth together. And the ultimate hope that we have is not for a disembodied existence in some ethereal, cloudy, vague place. It is a renewed, transformed creation. And so this new creation eschatology is central to N.T. Wright's vision. And it's also a very Jewish way of thinking. Another, another pattern of us, a way of thinking that's central to Jewish thought that is also central to N.T. Wright's way of thinking and approaching things is the emphasis on the corporate rather than the individual. And also the focus on history and the historical outworking of God's purposes through time, as opposed to simply timeless abstract truths, these timeless universal truths. This is seen in really rather stark ways in N.T. Wright's treatment of the Gospels in the New Testament. In the Gospels, when, when N.T. Wright talks about Jesus' proclamation of the forgiveness of sins, he emphasizes that what's meant here is, is not primarily Jesus dying for the, individual, the forgiveness of individuals' sins with God, but ultimately, this is a way of talking about the restoration of Israel, that the prophets speak about God forgiving Israel's sins, and the way that's then reflected and manifested is Israel is restored, the covenant is renewed. It's not that individual sins are not also forgiven as part of this, but they're set in the context of the restoration of the whole people. Again, this is a very much a Jewish way of thinking. It's not that N.T. Wright denies the significance of the individual and of God's saving work with individual. It's simply that he's trying to set God's work with individuals into a corporate context. And he's also trying to set it within a historical context of God's the outworking of God's purposes for Israel, such that you can't 
understand what God is doing in Jesus unless you've said it within the entire biblical story. The story of Israel. This is uh, where we saw in this er that er earlier when he criticized uh, interpretations of Jesus that saw him simply as a teacher of timeless truths as opposed to someone whose teaching had to be situated within the particular history of the people of Israel and its future hopes. Well, there's a lot more that could be said on all of these points, uh, but I would, just, uh, I would just want to conclude, again, by emphasizing, I think that the project that N.T. Wright has said is a very important project, namely recovering these Jewish perspectives. And that in these particular ways that I've pointed out, in recovering a Jewish narrative structure, a Jewish theological structure, and Jewish ways of thinking, particularly these holistic, corporate, historical ways of thinking, that N.T. Wright has, has succeeded to a great extent in recovering this Jewish perspective. I'll talk a little bit more about this this afternoon because this is uh, getting into the territory where I disagree yeah. with, uh, with N.T. Wright's treatment. Uh, but um, he sets these identity markers within the context of his, this notion of symbol. Uh, and uh, you noticed, uh, even in some of the quotes that, uh, that I gave to you, uh, he he talks about Paul uh, continuing to think using these fundamental categories of monotheism, election, and Israel, but then redefining the symbols in, w in, in which uh, these categories are expressed. Uh, and uh, when, when he speaks about uh, these fundamental Jewish symbols, he identifies four that are of particular importance. The, the temple, the land, the Torah, uh, and, uh, and then Jewish ethnicity, or the, the people of, of, of the Jewish people as a whole themselves. Uh, and, uh, in, and then part of what he does is to is, is argues that these four symbols are dramatically transformed and changed in the teaching of Jesus and in the teaching of Paul and the New Testament as a whole. And, uh, and so that's where I'm going to be departing from N.T. Wright. And I'll, so I'll say a little bit more about that later on. And then um, if I don't touch specifically on, on those the identity <laughs> markers, well, we could also discuss it more in the, in the questions. Yeah, this is, uh, no, this is, this is very central to N.T. Wright. And in fact, the way it is so central that it becomes also a point of controversy. Uh, he has actually been criticized for making it too central. And uh, m what I mean by this is he, he, he so emphasizes that Israel has been chosen for the sake of the nations that he has been, he has been faulted for instrumentalizing Israel, for, for treating Israel simply as a means to an end beyond itself. Uh, and, and in doing that, somewhat uh, distorting the way in which election is also simply an expression of love, actual uh, love for Israel, not simply 
uh, in order for Israel to fulfill a particular purpose. Um, and uh, so this is, uh, there's a tension here. Uh, and uh, I tend to think this is getting again more into the realm of the, the criticism. I, I tend to think his critics are right here uh, in that I think he, he can sometimes overly instrumentalize uh, election, um, but uh, it is, uh, this becomes a, a question of emphasis and it's always hard to pin someone's down, someone down because then he would defend, say, no, 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 and point to certain places in his writings where he clearly emphasizes this notion of simply God's love but, uh, for, for Israel. But the key thing is that, without doubt, this notion of Israel as a light for the nations, as a blessing for the nations, this is like, for him, the very heart of what election is about. Israel is chosen in order to deal with the brokenness of the world and the, the, to bring healing to the world. Yeah, we're, we're getting right in. We can't resist getting into the second uh, presentation, <laughs> can we? Uh, <laughs> uh, Uh, I think the, it will make more sense to address, I, I, would, I think I'll be better able to give an answer after I've elaborated um, uh, on the points I'll make in, in the, second, uh, the second lecture, because uh, I, th I only, I, I discovered after reading the 1600 pages of uh, Paul and the, and the Faithfulness of God, um, which is one of the great accomplishments of my life, I think, reading those six <laughs> um, uh, I discovered that N.T. Wright's thinking on these questions is uh, more complicated than I originally thought. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm a, I, I would have simply answered before reading that book, uh, well, Yes, G in, in, the reality is that in N.T. Wright, Jesus is simply a replacement for Israel. Uh, now, I think it's not quite that simple, although I think there's still a danger uh, uh, in his thought that moves in that direction, and uh, hopefully that'll become clearer uh, af after the second presentation. Yes, this is uh, it's a very good question. Uh, what, uh, I think that even the fact that the question can be asked uh, is itself a sign of, again, of something positive that N.T. Wright has done. Because what he's doing is he's, he's moving Christian thought in a Jewish, into these Jewish categories. And then in a sense, the debate becomes one that's functioning within these categories of how do we conceive then of, of, of exile and restoration? Where are we in God's clock, you know, in relationship to these? Um, now, uh, N.T. Wright has been another, way in which he's been criticized. As, uh, he has been criticized as overly emphasizing a kind of realized eschatology in, uh, in, in em his emphasis on Jesus' work is that Jesus in his resurrection has in fact already restored Israel. And that the the church ultimately is this manifestation or participation in the restoration of Israel. But uh, then this does raise, raise some problems 
Uh, and the kind of critique that, you, that you're referring to, Daniel, is one in which there is a tendency to have an overly triumphalist vision of what the church is. And you lose the sense that exile actually still continues. And I, I think this is a, a just critique, again, of N.T. Wright. It's one which is, not, which is somewhat independent of, this, of the issues I'm, I'm focusing on today, although it, it, it also is, is related. Uh, let me give you an, an illustration from a, uh, a New Testament text uh, where I think that uh, where N.T. Wright has actually ignored something important. We have a parable that uh, Jesus tells. Uh, well, it's not really a parable. Uh, Jesus is responding to his critics who are particularly Pharisaic critics, who are angry with him because he is eating with sinners and tax collectors. And so Jesus' response is, the, those, uh, will the, uh, the friends of the bridegroom, those who are in the presence of the bridegroom, are they gonna be mourning right now? In the presence of the bridegroom, or are they gonna be celebrating? He's, this is also in the context of him being criticized for not fasting like the disciples of, of John the Baptist. And so N.T. Wright looks at this text and he sets it within, I think, again, a very helpful Jewish context. Uh, the Jewish context is one of the Jewish pattern of fasting twice a week that emerges particularly in, in the ex exilic period in which the fasts are expressions of mourning for Israel's being in exile and a prayer for restoration, for Israel's future restoration. And so what, what N.T. Wright then says is, Jesus now has come to restore Israel, and therefore uh, this is not the time to fast. And he then sees that as a sign again that what Jesus has done in his death and resurrection is simply restored Israel. What he ignores, of course, then, is the way the text goes on to say that the fact that, that when the bridegroom is gone, the disciples will fast and will mourn. Uh, and which points to the fact that uh, there's this special period, yes, while Jesus is present, uh, and yet after the, the death and resurrection of Jesus, of course, the church continues to fast and continues to have the sense that it, there, there's at least an aspect of, of exile or galut or of di diaspora, which, uh, which remains as a very important category. So, Again, I, I tend uh, to agree with those critics who, uh, who fault N.T. Uh, but again, what I, I want to underline what I said at the very beginning of my response, I, I think that the, the very fact that this kind of discussion, could, this type of debate could even take place, comes because, through a recovery of Jewish categories. So, so I see it as as part of his success, even as I think uh, it's also a sign of where uh, there's something uh, a little bit askew. Well, uh, it, it certainly doesn't come up, of course, in his magnum opus, this these four volumes that have been written so far, in where it, which have focused on the Synoptic Gospels and on Paul, and then have, have touched on uh, other 
uh, writings of the New Testament as they had a bearing in particular on, uh, on resurrection. Uh, and because N.T. Wright has written so voluminously, uh, I am sure he has written about James. Uh, I have only seen some of what he's written through places where he's writing on the book of Acts and where he's dealing with James as a figure within the book of Acts. Uh, and what this again leads us in more into the realm of uh, where, uh, of points of disagreement that I would have with N.T. Wright. I think N.T. Wright would, 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 be, would think that James, uh, well, the overall position that N.T. Wright takes is that Paul, for Paul and the, the early Jesus movement as a whole, there was an understanding that the Torah and distinctive Jewish practices, those practices that were the identity, identifying markers, uh, as the earlier question was using, of distinctive Jewish identity, were, um, were no longer uh, in force uh, for, for the followers of Jesus. And so he believes that Paul was not, in any traditional Jewish sense, a Torah observant Jew. Uh, he would think that James, he would acknowledge that James and the Jerusalem community continue to observe Jewish, these Jewish customs. But he would, uh, I think, hold something similar to a traditional Christian way of understanding, which was, is that they did that for missionary purposes. You know, like, this was their culture, they were, they were permitted to do these things, and clearly if they were going to be effective in bearing witness to Jesus in the midst of the Jewish people, they, were, they would have to continue to live this way. Uh, and it was appropriate for them to do so, but that it was not something that was incumbent upon them as a covenantal obligation, as something that was a commandment of God, that because they were Israel, because they were Jews, they were, supposed, they, they were obligated to continue to uh, circumcise their sons and, and, and maintain the Jewish dietary laws and observe Shabbat and the holidays, um, etc. Um, so that, this is uh, N.T. Wright's framework for understanding not just Paul, but the entirety of the early Jesus movement and Jesus himself. Um, again, this, is, this now is, gets into the points of disagreement that I would have with him. But he, you know, when he treats like these second, second century and third century sources that point towards uh, a Jewish, Jewish life being lived by Jewish disciples of, of Jesus, um, such as the pseudo-Clementine um, uh, writings. He sees these as like later developments that are discontinuous with the, early, with the, the, the Jerusalem community. Uh, and, uh, and so, again, these are points where I would have disagreement with him, but we, you can see how, yeah, you can see how this will lead us into our second session. <laughs>